environmental factors and psychological factors may contribute in the chronic pain. Sometimes you can fall in a vicious cycle, starts with the acute pain, treatment is not done, you're not getting better from whatever the disease or conditions, and obviously people get frustrated, angry, depressed, the vicious cycle starts. Um, <coughs> chronic pain continues when the treatment starts. So sometimes the pain continues, continues when you do the multiple treatment. So the condition doesn't resolve and your pain continues. So what are the possible treatment options for the chronic pain? Medications, physical therapy, occupational therapy, acupuncture, uh, psychological therapies, people go for biofeedback, meditations, yoga. Uh, alternative therapies like chiropractic, yoga, me you know, meditation. Uh, Thank you, Pancharki. So, intervention pain procedures that you do here depends upon your condition. Uh, corrective surgery, spine surgery, or other kind of surgeries. And then medical devices like spinal cord stimulator that we're going to talk today, or the pain pump. So, we're going to talk about the spinal cord stimulation. So, what are the indications for the spinal cord stimulation? There are lots of indications, and there are two kinds of indication we divide. One is called FDA approved, means FDA, the federal uh, drug people or the government people has approved condition for the spinal stimulator. Basically that means most of the insurance being covered. It, uh, the other category called off-label. Off-label means it's not FDA approved, but it's, again, physicians all over the world, the United States, they use the spinal stimulator to help with those conditions. Now that's questionable, your insurance may cover, may not cover, need prior authorization. So that's the only difference. So any kind of radiculopathy, lumbar radiculopathy, cervical radiculopathy, thoracic radiculopathy, post-laminectomy syndrome, basically after the spinal surgery, some patients continue with the, yes? What's radiculopathy? Lumbar radiculopathy. Second one. What is that? It's a radiculopathy of the, the pain going in your leg or the pain going in your arms from the neck. So, lumbar radiculopathy is basically back pain and pain going in the leg. Cervical radiculopathy is basically neck pain going in your arms. And the lumbar spinal stenosis, pain back or neck surgery syndrome. There is something called reflex sympathetic dystrophy or complex regional pain syndrome. It's a whole um, sympathetic system you have in the sympathetic nervous system has a malfunction and that can happen either just <coughs> happens body wise or you can have the nerve injury leading to that uh, condition. Peripheral nerves neuralgia, peripheral nerves injury and pain. So if someone has a specific nerve injury and continue causing pain, the stimulator will work. That's for peripheral nerve stimulators. Uh, painful peripheral neuropathy People have neuropathies from diabetes, alcohol use, from the uh, uh, metabolic disorders or toxins. So if someone has neuropathy, that's painful, not just numbness thingy. Uh, but there are painful neuropathies where you have burning and pain and stinging. The uh, spinal stimulator helps. Post herpetic neuralgia, if you have shingles and then you start having pain after that, that does not get better. With any medications, any other treatment, you can use uh, spinal stimulator. Occipital neuralgia, there's a pinching around here, causing your headaches and all those things, you can use for that. post thoracotomy syndrome, patients has surgery for their lungs or uh, heart, and they have the big cut for the surgery. <coughs> when they do that, you can have the nerve injuries, and you can have probably chronic nerve pain, so you can use for that. Atypical an angina or refractory angina. Some people have the the heart heart pain, <coughs> angina, not not my you know the infarction or the heart attack. But this is kind of just atypical heart pain that's not getting bad with the medication or it's not dangerous. Sometimes we put the stimulator to help with that. Non-operable peripheral vascular disease. Someone has a vascular disease, arterial disease or venous disease. And it's bad enough that it's 
cannot be corrected with the surgery, like you know, vascular surgery or uh, cardiologist cannot fix that. The stimulator does help with that too. They know it's phenomena, it's just another vascular disease where your fingers get white when you go in the cold. Um, and that can also help. And also there's something called pain, phantom pain after the amputation. Someone has amputation on a traumatic or gangrene, and sometimes they continue having phantom pain. Means if you cut their leg at the knee level, they still feel the pain all the way through the foot. So that's called phantom pain. So the stimulator helps with that. And one more thing is the spinal cord injury. Someone has spinal cord injury, <coughs> specifically incomplete spinal cord injury. So means they have you know, weakness and paraplegia, but they have the burning pain in your uh, lower legs. That also helps. So typically, spinal cord stimulator helps with any kind of nerve pain. Any kind of pain happening because of the nerve injury or nerve inflammation. If anything happening from the joints, usually it doesn't work. So just general contraindications. Infraction, if you're having local or systemic infraction, obviously we have to treat that first. You have to be infraction free to you know, uh, put this system in. Any spinal tumor, if it's coming really in the way where we're gonna put the leads, uh, you really cannot do it. Pacemaker defibrillator is a, we call it relative, but pacemaker is, when you put the, put the spinal cord stimulator, it can interfere. So, if someone definitely needs spinal cord and they have pacemaker, we have to really coordinate with cardiologists and we have to trial you know, how they do it. You know, you don't want to mess with these things. You know, these are as if it is dangerous. So be truly very careful. Blood thinners, obviously we have to stop the blood thinners for these procedures. It depends upon what kind of blood thinners you are on, whether you cannot stop or not, or whether they can switch to like, uh, you know, something called the injection blood thinners temporarily. It depends. If you absolutely cannot stop the blood thinner, you probably not able to get the spinal cord. Severe central spinal stenosis, so if your stenosis is very severe in your neck and low back, that there's not enough space to the lead, you cannot have that. And the reason is if you have bad spinal stenosis, there's not enough space, you put the lead there, you basically compress the spinal cord more, and you don't want that. So then you're actually causing more stenosis instead of helping with damage. So we always have to evaluate that. Anesthesia contraindication if someone comes and say, I cannot have any kind of anesthesia. That's kind of contraindication is very hard because the trial part you can do under Valium or no Valium. But when it comes for the permanent implant, obviously we have to use some anesthesia. You cannot tolerate that with the Valium when you cut your spine. So. Psychiatric disorders, if someone has very uh, severe psychiatric disorder underlying, you cannot put this because not going to work. Sometimes it's very hard to differentiate which one is causing pain. Is it pain or psychiatric disorder is causing pain. So it's very hard to treat pain with these unless it's very, very under control and psychiatrist says, hey, it's okay to go ahead. Severe dementia or Alzheimer's disease, obviously, patient has to understand and know how to operate this system. You know, because it's a programming involved. So you need to know. You need to know some you know, instrumentation, someone, something, you know, to operate, like DVD player or something. Someone says they cannot handle or play or use a DVD player or a CD or something. It's very hard for them to do unless someone there all the time to help them. So how does particle stimulator works? There is something called gate theory. A gate theory basically closing a gate for the pain. So closing the gate for the pain sensation. So spinal cord, stimul cord stimulation disrupts the pain signals traveling between the spinal cord and the brain so you may feel pain relief. The neurostimulator delivers mild electrical impulses or electric shocks to your spinal cord which disrupts the pain signals traveling between your spinal cord and brain. The impulses travel from the device to your spinal cord over thin insulated medical wires called leads. Okay. So, in a simple, if I pinch you here hard, your pain is 
is here, or your attention is here. At the same time, if I do the injection here, you may not feel this. That's simple. So we're stimulating the large nerve fiber, the spinal cord. And by doing that, we basically diverting brain's attention to there, and you basically ignoring, the brain ignoring your pain signal. So basically, this is basically blocking the pain. That's why it's called gate here. It's just closing the gate on the pain, the pain sensation. So same thing, just a little picture here. Um, so we have external remote that controls the basically some of the programs. So this is like programming like your DVD player or other car thing. Okay, so it falls under low currents, goes through the wire. So this is basically battery, there's a power, and there's a programming, it's like computer chip. It depends upon what program is set, you will set the electrical stimulation right here through the wire, and it stimulates your spinal cord. When you do that, you, you probably you're gonna feel a little soft buzzing, tingling in your back, buttock, in the leg, or the both legs. And that has to be like comfortable. Most of people like that. Uh, and by doing that, you're basically blocking the pain. Is it fast enough <clears throat> when you get the pain right? How fast does that kick in as soon as you get the it, pain? It could be constant or intermittent. Depends upon what is what's your need. That's how you program it. Some people doesn't need it at night. You turn it off. The other the other time is basically intermittent pulsing. It's a constant. You can leave yeah, it on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's gonna be on. Once you program it, it's gonna do its job. So when the programming happens, it could be either every three seconds, every five seconds, the pulse is going. You don't have to do anything. The only thing you have to change the program and intensity depends upon if you need more or less. So you can control all those things. So one, one day you have more pain and if you want to increase the intensity, increase the power, you can do it. The second day, if you don't have too much pain or to decrease it, that's fine. But the pulsing going, that's automatic. That's so it's always going to get the pain stopping to yes. your head? Yes, yeah. it has to go, it has to pulse <coughs> every few seconds. Otherwise, if you stop that, the pain is going to go. If you stop pulsing, if you stop, if you stop using or you stop the pulsing going to the stimulator, your pain is going to come back. It has to be constant. constant. But usually it's not constantly stimulating. It's every five seconds, seven seconds, depends upon the program. Like a TENS unit? Yes. So this is a kind of TENS unit. A TENS unit just works for the superficial skin mm -hmm. muscle. Mm -hmm. But this is more advanced uh, system. And it's inserted. It's inside? Yes. Once it's inserted, is it MRI safe? All the systems now are MRI compatible. Okay. Like I have epilepsy, so I get a brain scan annually. So Correct. So the only thing they have is certain requirements. You cannot just go any MRI. So most of the MRI places has that. It has to be certain magnet force. Yeah, like the nodes. Correct. Yeah. And there are special coils. And nowadays, most of the MRI place has the coils and everything. So yeah, it's not hard enough. I had a hard time finding an MRI place that would take me to do another MRI because of the clip. I had a clip in my hand. Right. The clip is different. Because they are worried about the clip dislodging and you can have the brain hemorrhage. But here they made, the, the companies made the leads MRI safe. Yes. The problem with the MRI was not the lead movement, more with the magnet. The MRI is a magnet and when you go under the MRI, the lead you put in the spinal cord, sometimes gets heat up. Heat up? Yeah, heat up. When the lead heats up, it's basically, you know, cauterizes spinal cord, so that's why they say no, but now they have insulated very well, so it doesn't happen. You do have to take your controller with you and the radiology tech has to turn it off, yeah, and then you turn it on. The worst thing can happen if you don't turn it off, your battery may just turn off with a magnet and then you can turn it on or it gets turned on when you are at the MRI. So, Testing to see if the spinal system is right for you. 
So spatter stimulation trial is important for a variety of reasons. It allows us to basically see feel the varied levels of stimulation that the system can provide. So when you use it for the trial, you cannot feel what you feel. Not everybody likes it. You know, you can, most of the time it has to be soft, buzzing, tingling. You know, but some patients may not like it. Some patients are like, oh, it's too much, or I don't like it, and you don't want it. Assess how well the neurostimulant relieves your pain during different activities. So you trial to see if it works for you or not. Decide if you want to go ahead with a permanent implant. Understand how the system component works. Someone does the trial and they don't understand or it's very hard difficulty doing it, it's not a really good idea. You know? But it's an implant. You, know, you don't want to really put it if you really don't understand. Prior to the trial, you may have the psychological evaluation to determine is it good for you or not. And that depends upon the insurance. Most of the third party insurance requires uh, psychology evaluation before even go for the trial, before they give prior authorization. For the Medicare, usually <coughs> Medicare requires psychology evaluation before you input the permanent. They don't require before the trial, so that's not a good thing. And there's a couple of things for the insurance one. The insurance wants to make sure you really understand this is this implantable device, because you know allergic pain, as I say making sure there's no underlying psychological disorder causing pain to the this doesn't work. No secondary gain, you know, addictive medications. If all those things are going to lead to his pain. Yes? So I've read there's a lot of patients that eventually they want to have these removed. Like what percentage of your patients are wanting them removed? I would say uh, all the patients <coughs> before it, I don't think so I have removed any. Did I remove other people's? Yes. And we can dis I'm going to discuss more about that. I have a question. How long do you do the trial? How long? The trial goes for five to six days. Days? That's it. Five to six days, yes. That's it. So how do you do the trial? So it's like an epidural injection. Basically, we put the lead in a, something called posterior epidural space in a lumbar spine area. Depends. If you have any hardware or not, so it depends. The entry point is up to, I see, main, where I'm going to go. It depends upon where your hardware, if you have surgery done before. When we look at your MRI, we see, making sure there's no other problems to go up. So we choose the starting point in your spine. We put the needle in the epidural space. After we put the needle, uh, basically we can uh, guide the wire up. So it will go about, I would say, mid to lower thoracic area. That's where your main spinal cord is. The spinal cord is, the main spinal cord is uh, up to L1, in the lumbar area. Once lumbar area starts, that's where the spinal cord ends, real spinal cord. After that, all the nerve roots goes down. So you have to stimulate right here. And the reason is the way the anatomy of the spinal cord is, when you want to get the pain relief in your back, in the legs, the fibers that supplies those areas is basically here between T7 to T10. So that's why you want to stimulate that. Stimulating too low, you may not get back and butter. You may get the legs or foot. Stimulating too high, you get too much. You may get into your reach and everything. You don't want that. So it depends where you want. Where your pain is, where we need the coverage, where do we have control of the pain, you can adjust your uh, spinal cord stimulator position. And that's why the trial is important, yes. Can you add the spinal cord? Yes. It depends where it starts. But yes, it's it's one of the indications. If the cardiac spinal cord is causing you the you know, uh, radicular pain, pain going in your legs, like uh, nerve pain, yes. The tether score call usually happens down you know, 4, 5, L5, L4, L5, 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 L
I'm sorry? That goes all the way up to the cervical spine? You can, but that's way, really hard to drag up. If you want to go cervical spine, you go in a cervical spine, like upper thoracic entry. Because it's very hard to drag. You need the long wire. It always a little bit epidural at the adhesions. Even though you don't have problem thoracic, that may interfere going up. So the longer the distance you go, it's hard to guide it. So we try to go as short as possible. But the active part of the wire there is only about two or three inches long. So this is an empty wire. So just to show, so this is empty wire. I'll pass this later, but I'll show you that. So you see here, this is basically, uh, you see under the radio, the gap between these two black spots is an electrode. So that's where the, uh, the electricity comes out. And most of the wire has eight electrodes on each side. That's where the electricity come out. Now, does the electricity come out from all? No. What happens, we basically try to cover as much as we can and put the lead. Then, when we program, maybe we use like one, two, and three electrodes in the middle to get that stimulation. So it depends upon where. Sometimes we try to get here. So when we do the trial, we try different electrodes combination to uh, see where we can find the spark. Okay. If I have the lead here and I start getting stimulation here, one and two, that's good. So what we do is we will then you know, get the wire up or down to get the stimulation in the middle. So in case wire moves a little bit, we don't lose that stimulation. We can reprogram. So this is in like anterior view under the x-ray. This is the lateral view from the side as our loops. This is your epidural space. So this is how, this is schematic. This is your spinal cord. These are the nerve roots kind of coming out and see how it's staying here on your spinal cord. And then this electricity, this comes out. It's very mild pulses. Once you have the trial done, for five, six days, you come back in the office, you don't have to go to the procedure room or anything. It's basically, we take the wire here. So whether that's trial work for you or not, this is the trial wire, it basically comes out. So I slowly just pull it out, right in the office. And it's a small hole there, basically we put little antibiotics, bend it, and you're good to go. The, the battery part of this, the battery part and programmer for the trial basically stays outside. So we just take it up everything outside. So leads comes out and there is a battery part, battery here, battery pack. We attach the lead there and then we tape it up right here outside. So nothing inside except this wire going in, that's it. Depends upon, I usually try to put one wire in a midline and we do the stimulation and see how many areas, how much area is covered. This wire has to be kind of in the midline of the spinal cord. Spinal cord midline in the back. Now, your spine midline does not, sometimes does not correlate with the spinal cord midline. It could be, you know, either twisted. So, if you put one wire, if you need the coverage, you have pain both sides, back, or legs, and you cover both sides. Most of the time, we are able to get the coverage with the one lead, but sometimes we can't. For whatever the reason, you know, the spinal cord is, you know, you know crooked or we're not getting enough stimulation, we can cover both sides. And I have to put the second wire. So one wire will cover your left side, one wire cover your right side. So we try the one wire first. So on the maximum, you can just put two wires. One more than that. So how does the trial work? Just again, Recap. The trial period can last five to seven days. The procedure takes typically 30 to 90 minutes. I have sometimes it took me six minutes, five minutes. And the, the maximum of time, time takes is to get that stimulation. When we put the wire where we want to, we stimulate and try to get that soft buzz and tingling in your painful areas. So while you're on the table, uh, wire in the place, we connect with this wireless uh, device and then we start stimulating. And when stimulate, we, get, we will ask you where do you, you feel any soft buzz and tingle. 
a yes or no, if a yes, very, very fair. Right side, left side, back, whatever. And we ask you, is it covering all your painful areas? You're going to feel it. So you're going to say, yes, it's covering all my painful areas. Or no, it's not covering. I'm just feeling here, not here. Then we, as I say, we're going to stimulate other electrodes. And basically, we try to cover, we try to cover 100% of pain, pain area. Sometimes we can cover up to 85, 90%. That's not bad. So that that's, takes a maximum time. You know, placing lead sometimes doesn't take too long unless you have bad spine, like very, really, you know, scoliosis rotation. Then it may take a little time if you're scarring in that your space for whatever reason. Sometimes we have to, you know, make it. Um, and it's just usually done in the procedure room, like all other injections. If you have a lot of scar tissue, is it harder to get the wires up? Yes. If you have very, very bad scar tissue, then possibly they may not be able to place it. So I've had like 30 evolutions in my cerebral spine over the 10 years since the injury. So there's a lot of scar tissue in there. But the ablation is usually outside. Okay. It's going to be your space. But we're not going to know until you go inside. And MRI really doesn't show the scar. And otherwise, you have to do with the contrast and everything. So if it's minimal scarring, we can try to, you know, sometimes we go like around, like it's a traffic, you know, just to other thing, depends. Sometimes we try a little soft, you know, try to break it up and we may able to break it up. But if you're scarring, then you really don't want to push too hard to break it because you can have the dural puncture, that's the dura that's right above your spinal fluid. You don't want it. So, yeah, we don't use any force. We try like very soft try to go around, you can. Most times it's okay. It's very, I would say less than 1% time, it's, you cannot. It depends on where. And it depends upon where it is. If it's like the right in the beginning where the entry point is, you just move out, you know, try to avoid that. So the temporary system, as I say, a couple of components. You have like this wire or for temporary lead and that goes in your spine. You have this wireless device, that's where the lead attaches, comes out of your uh, body, attaches here, and that's going to be on your back, right side, left side, depends upon the side you sleep, you try to put it, so it doesn't interfere. And then you have this uh, uh, handheld device that works, you know, uh, Bluetooth, or wireless, with this. this is a programmer. And uh, after the trial, when you go in the recovery room, after you recover, usually we have the uh, wrap that can, uh, they're going to go over again, stimulate you again, get the program, and teach you, and you know, probably the husband's a different other, they teach them to how to use it. So, after that, you can go home. So for the trial here, when you come in, first we put the IV access. We do give you IV antibiotics before the procedure precaution, you know, because it's a, you know, the foreign body going, so we always want to make sure you the precaution of infection. Once the trial is done, when you go home, we usually prescribe you oral antibiotics, then you take until the wire comes out. Again, profilenses. You have foreign body going in, coming out. You have to uh, take a precaution to not have any impression. So those are the only two things. For those five, six days, you're not going to shower. You cannot really make that in your breath. So yeah, you have to do sponge bath, you know, X. So <laughs> when you come back in five, six day, uh, five or six days for the, after the trial, as I showed before, we take out the wire. But when you come out, we're going to ask you the questions. Hey, how you did? Did you like it? Did it help? You know, we have a document, obviously. You, know, you have to let us know whether you want permanent or not, it was successful for you or not. So how you, uh, Besides success with the reduction of pain and symptoms by at least 50% or more during trial period. So if your pain and symptoms are more than 50% better for that four or five days, you know, that's that's pretty good. 
that's called success. Reduction of pain medication. If you're taking pain medications, particularly the short end, if you're long acting, it's very hard to stop. But like short acting medicine, you don't have pain, you have minimal pain, so you don't need those medications. So if you're using pain meds four times a day, you drop one, one a day or two a day at least. That's 50% reduction. So that's all it's helping. Uh, increase in our function, able to perform activities daily living with no pain or minimal pain, increase in functional capacity. So we take over the daily activities, you know, walking, either being showering, going to the bathroom, going to the post office, or the, or your mailbox, whatever, causing the problem. Um, so you want to see that it's increasing that. So not just the pain reduction, not just the reduction in the pain medication, but can you do more? You know, because that's the goal to increase your daily activities. Now, activities of daily living does not include uh, bungee jumping, skydiving, <laughs> uh, fights, running, marathon. No. I mean, you're not able to do that even before, that's why you're going to see later, correct? Can this help with the short-buttedness? I kind of walk now since I have back surgery. Stagger a little bit. If you have pain, then it helps. It only helps with the pain. Because it just blocks the pain. Right. So whether the trial is successful or not, the temporary lead placing the spine usually comes out. That means no wire or any other kind of hardware will be left in your body. So if you need a help, wire comes out. So it's like nothing left. That, uh, oh my God, I went through these and I have now the foreign body in me. <laughs> but that's, I think, more you know, people are afraid, like, oh, I don't want this because if it doesn't work, what are you going to do? And that's why the beauty of the trial. You know, you're going to know whether it helps or not. In my patients, when, when it's successful, they don't want you to take out the wire. <laughs> really? I want it. I say, well, I have to take it out. The trial, why? Getting So after the trial, the, if the trial is successful and the spinal cord stimulation is right for you, a permanent system will be implanted during surgical procedure. And after the implant, obviously, you have to follow up, you know, um, as we say, just making sure everything is okay and when it's okay, because obviously, you know, get you go. So permanent spinal stimulator how it's happening. So this is minor surgery. We have to implant everything. So we usually use something called paddle lead and I'll show you. This is, so this was like trial lead, all right, one or two. And this is called paddle lead. It has a different, it comes in different sizes. But again, it's a lead and you see the electrodes and we program that electricity will come out <coughs> with the specific specific electrodes to deliver the, the electricity. And the difference is these leads have those electrodes around, 360. These are visually uni unidirectional. So these are much more uh, efficient than these ones because this delivers your electricity in just one direction, just down to the spinal cord. This will go all over. So obviously use more power here, less power here. Also, this lead could slid, you know, up or down. While this is very contour to the spinal cord, it will stay there and get a heavy side so it really doesn't move. So these are much more effective and successful. We cannot do trial with this because it's a very big one. We cannot insert. So that brings the point. Like, we cannot insert this lead through the needle in a pure space. So we have to do minor surgery. Basically, we go down to your spine and we basically shave off the bone right above the your space to make the space. We basically sleep that under your under your vertebral body and put on the spinal cord. Once that done, we anchor the lead. Basically, we put a couple of sutures with the bone or the strong fiber tissue and make it so it doesn't move around. And then, it, obviously, it comes out from the skin here, from the incision. And then what we do is, so 
kind of these are the component lead again this lead or this lead this is the battery and this is this is the old programmer but I show you there's no programmer so it depends upon the system you get you know different programmers again these are the leads different kind of size of leads these are called percutaneous leads so they are thin leads and these are parallel leads so we put system in and then depends upon which side you want the and your buttock area or depends where you have the more you know adipose tissue you know we call the, uh, the real estate we basically choose where you're going to put the battery it also depends upon which side you sleep and all those things so you say i want the le left side so under this when we do surgery is create a pocket, we make an incision in the skin, we go down there and basically we create a pocket to insert this under that. The, this doesn't go too deep. It's just under the skin and uh, subcutaneous tissue and some fats above the above the muscle. So it's just superficial, not too deep. If but it's not sorry, if you lay your hand you don't feel that together. If you depend that's what we ask if you if you sleep almost every time left side, you usually put the right side. Okay. But at the same time, we also try to ask you, you know, which side you are sleep, and all those things. So we make a pocket, and we have the surgical instrument. We tunnel these leads under the skin, and bring the leads in the pocket, and then we connect with this. So everything goes inside. Nothing is showing off. We also try to put the pocket under your belt line. So when you sit, it's not, you're not going to sit on it, but at the same time, it's not going to push up on your belt. It's going to be below your bikini line, so you can go to the beach. That's fine. What you make the decision, you gotta, you can't sleep on that side? Is that what you're saying? No. I mean, you can, but it depends how, how, you, how you do it. It's, this is not too deep, so most of the time it doesn't bother. And nowadays, the batteries are not that big, like before used to be very big. But now it's, most of people doesn't bother. And the way we put it, if you lay on the like side, it's probably not going to come because you're going to be lying on your hip. So right. you're not going to sit right on there. Yeah. Sitting is important. But the way we put it, the sitting is not supposed to bother, it's not supposed to sit on there. So, when you come for the permanent, before we take you back, I usually come to the bedside. We may, I make you sit on the bedside, <coughs> see where your bag line is, and we actually draw the picture, make sure where you're going to put it. Does this help you stand up straighter? No. So under the X-ray, it looks like that. This is kind of the lead. It looks bad in the picture. <laughs> yeah, they probably put the wire here. So it's a surgical implant, it's different. But usually it's upside. Depends upon the condition and sometimes they go up to down, down to up, depends. But that's how the wire is usually not that usually the straight and coming here. That's how it looks under X. So benefit benefits of the spinal stimulation. Include ability to participate in activities of daily living, effective pain relief, more ability to function, personalized pain management, as so you can control when you're going to increase the power, increase the power. Uh, controllable, you know, but you can make your, you know, maintain your own program. You can program multiple programs in that, depends upon what you need, you know, what time you need the relief, what activities you can do, all programs. You just have to switch the program. So it's, it's like, Computer. The risks of the spinal stimulation, every procedure <coughs> has a risk, depends. This is just the generalized numbers. So minor swelling, redness, post-procedural pain, in, in overall documentation, in infection, three to five percent, and that's why we very cautious about the you know pre op medications. Yes. How long is the battery? The batteries last uh, four to five years. That's 
If the battery comes to the end, basically you open the pocket and just switch the battery. As long as everything else is working, you just switch the battery. Depends upon how much power you use, the battery may last less. It's like other batteries, like if you use constantly high power, 24-7, it's going to drain out very quickly. So you're not charging the batteries. The non-rechargeable. The reason I prefer non-rechargeable batteries is most of the people we have, you forget to recharge the battery. You will amaze I have patient comes and I ask, sometimes they don't come for a year, two years, because they're doing well. And then, like, they come and ask, like, how is your spinal cord stimulator doing? Doing well. How is your battery doing? What? <laughs> Did you charge? Now, if you don't recharge, it's going to be dead. Oh, <laughs> recharge. They have the wireless recharge thing. Yeah. So you recharge the component to the plug and basically you put it there. They give you the bell and you put that on that and you get charged for the same. So you don't have to. Like your body becomes Tesla. <laughs> so infection, CSF is your spinal fluid leak leakage, epidural hematoma, lead migration is lead can go up and down, lead fraction means the lead can break, the hardware malfunction overall, connection problems, battery failure, uh, damage insulation, pain around battery side, loss of therapy effect. Sometimes you lose the effect. Uh, therapy did not meet the patient expectation. So loss of therapy effect is either there is something called neuroplasty. Sometimes you stimulate the nervous system, they basically adapt and stop working. That's what neuroplasty. If that happens, you lose the effect. The second reason you lose the effect, your, your disease condition gets worse. That is worse enough that stimulator cannot control them. Now, you can reprogram your stimulator to make it work, but it's going to get the point it may not work because condition is so worse. <coughs> and I'm talking about like patient does not have surgery and have stenosis and we do for the stenosis or radicular symptom and the stenosis starts getting worse, the point comes that you now keep getting inflamed, you may not stop working. So if there's a loss of therapy effect, someone comes and says, hey, stop working, obviously we go through the things like this to get it worse. We get the MRI, x-rays, making sure the battery is working. The beauty of the battery, just wirelessly, we can just see what's going on in the battery. By the way, when you do the trial, and you come back and you see the trial did not work, oh. we can look and see how many hours of that five days you use. Mm -hmm. So you use three hours in six days, you come back and see it didn't work, we will yell at you. <laughs> <laughs> you can see it. <laughs> so you cannot lie that, oh no, it was on five days and it didn't work, no. <laughs> Just have fire. <laughs> and the same thing with the, so we can get lots of information. It's kind of computer to, to help us, you know. And it's nothing can catch you just to help the treatment. CPAP, I have a CPAP machine and it actually, it radios or something. How often can use it, something like that. I don't think so, really. It's very good. No, no, it's not good in the I was just wondering if this uh, keeps a memory or a log of when you use it, how you use it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can put it up there. So if you have to have access to it, pull it out? or No, we pull it up. So, like, our RAP has, they can, with well, the hardware, they have to just extract information. Yeah, it's wireless. Yeah. yeah. You know, we just say, yeah, program. So you come out and actually gives you the whole scenario. And that's how we use it. It helps a lot to decide whether battery failure, plant failure, the battery, like if the battery is draining too quickly, all those things. Yeah. 
if this works, then that would eliminate the resigning the spirit. But that's where the trial comes into play. Right. As I say, any pain coming from the joints did not get there. These ones only pain coming from the nerves. Right, but those nerves are different. You have pain coming from the joints. So you're not the spine. So this this may not work for the facetrons, this may not work for the sacred react joints. Because there's a whole different innervation. So you cannot stimulate those nerves. If the spinal cord stimulator, you cannot stimulate those tiny nerves. Like you cannot with the pain, not with the facets, not with the sacred react joint So it doesn't work. Sacred react joint pain, yeah, you can probably put the pain just uh, by the sacral iliac joint, stimulate and see if it works, but it's not indication. How do you know if it's in the joint or you say it doesn't work on Yeah, we do that diagnostic block. We do that diagnostic facet block. So if that works, we know it's facet. And then try it. So if you come back after trial and say it didn't work, my pain didn't get bad in the back, we know it's what about stenosis? It doesn't. It doesn't. It works for the spinal stenosis. It works. Yes. If you have spinal stenosis and how you stack pain, pain within your leg, it does work. So ex expectation of the light beyond pain. It is important to remember that spinal cord stimulation therapy does not eliminate the source of your pain or cure any underlying disease. It can help you manage the pain. So as I say, this is just blocking the pain, nothing else. We're not curing anything. We're not, we're not curing this condition. We're not curing spinal stenosis. Basically, we stimulate spinal cord to block the pain. So is your spinal cord stenosis going to get worse? Yes. Or this condition can worse, yes. So that's all those things not gonna get back. So yes. <laughs> does severe scoliosis prevent the insertion of the leads? It the may S curve? Make, it may make difficult. But you can still yes. do it? Okay. Have okay. I done it? Yes. Okay. It's also important to set the realistic goals. As I say, you know, we're not doing so you can go out there and do the bungee jumping and you know, skydiving. This is for the improve your pain so you can do your daily activities, social activities, some minor recreational activities. You cannot really go back and play um, uh, intense sports and all those things. So yeah, these are not this is not for that. Going forward, um, Originally, we were talking about uh, mental conditions. What if you ins put this in permanently in somebody that eventually develops dementia? Do you, do you then take it out? It depends if it's working, we leave it alone. Okay. Sometimes uh, you program that and its program is working. Uh -huh. You may not have to use that at all. You okay. don't have to do anything. Okay. Eventually, dementia comes, they cannot handle it. Um, you can just leave on the one program and it works. Because those people do feel pain. Oh, yes, yes. The only problem with that is just if they're not able to manage, manage the device. Mm -hmm. So they develop dementia, but maybe their significant other, daughter, you know, son can't have it. Right? Mm -hmm. The problem is, are they going to understand what you Right. Or something like Alzheimer's or something, that's the problem. Right. Or you can set up on the program and if they have that, you know, many times, if this, it may take probably around six weeks max, eight weeks max, to uh, really uh, get the, your program going. Right. Some people have right away, some people have to do some adjustments to get the perfect program. And once it's done, usually, you don't have to mess around. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.
two and any questions? What's the time frame like you're taking a new patient? How quickly does this happen? I want one for Christmas. Depends upon. <laughs> is it oh, it's very big. Depends upon the insurance. So, as I say, if you are commercial insurance, I think we're trying to move around the Veterans Administration. It's great to pay for this. It's only a five dollars. I think it's paid. So, if you would like to uh, schedule an appointment to come in so that we can check benefits and go throughout that process, we actually can do that this evening. We have wonderful staff over here that can schedule any appointments. Absolutely. Yeah, they, and we they can check in. And I'm going through the psychological. I have my last. So I'm just going to pass it on to me. Well, also, if you don't have any more questions for Dr. Phil, our seminar was sponsored by Medtronic, so if you have any questions about the, um, about the device, Jake is here to answer any of those questions. But this is how it goes. This is the whole wire. These wires go in your pocket.